Before he passed away, Jim Flaherty had planned to take the next four months off to go sailing, to recover his health, and then to look for a new job on Bay Street. Now he leaves a legacy of high accomplishment and deep friendship. And some of those friends join me now. James Rajat, who is the chairman of the House of Commons Committee and a very close personal friend of Mr. Flaherty. David McLaughlin, who was the former chief of staff to Mr. Flaherty. And in Toronto, uh, Peggy Nash, who was the uh, NDP finance critic during much of Mr. Flaherty's tenure as finance minister. Uh, James, I want to ask you first off, uh, what is the personal legacy of your friend? Well, he's, he's obviously left a tremendous political legacy, and as Jim, I mean, the last one of the last few times I saw him, I went to his office, he took me around, introduced to every one of his staffers, and one of the staffers had done up a list showing that he was going to soon become the longest-serving conservative finance minister. So he has a tremendous political legacy, but Bob, I mean, to your question, the memories of the last uh, day here have just been the memories I've had of of him as a friend. Of, we used to do annual uh, trips to Ireland every summer, golf trips. Uh, we'd go on many sporting trips together with he and his sons, most often his son John, who's a huge sports fan. And I'm just being flooded with memories of who he was as a person. Incredibly decent, kind, caring, uh, uh, down to earth. His, one of his favorite things to do was just to grab some colleagues and friends and go for ribs in the market. And that's the way he loved to spend an evening. So. It's, uh, it's a real mixed emotion, of, and, but a, a lot of memories of a wonderful man and a tremendous mentor to me. Ms. Nash, you uh, and Mr. Flaherty were polar opposites in terms of uh, economic philosophy. You come from the labor movement. Mr. Flaherty was the ultimate free enterpriser, and yet you had a bond and admiration for him. Yeah, that's certainly right. I did. I, I, I wasn't a personal friend. We didn't go out for drinks or dinner or anything, but um, I always felt we got along. I, I knew uh, him as a tough opponent when I challenged him in the house. I knew he'd give back as, as good as he got, uh, but he was always someone who was very approachable. If I needed to meet with him, I could meet with him, and I I found him refreshingly frank when we would sit around uh, his boardroom table and, and chat about a particular issue. And uh, I always knew that he never took my opposition personally as I didn't take his. And that uh, he, was, he, he was just a colleague that you could tell had a, had a big heart and was always very approachable. And I think. Uh, most people saw in him that he had a really keen sense of humor, and and that's often in short supply in the House of Commons. Well, David, he had to deal with some very major economic issues confronting the country. Uh, what was it like working with him around the table? And uh, I get the sense that pragmatism ruled more than ideology. Oh, he was incredibly pragmatic uh, because he there was so much riding on what he did and what he didn't do and on his decisions. I mean, you think of that first year and a half, which I think were very crucial in setting the tone and the, and the seeds for Mr. Flaherty's success. I mean, it was minority government days. We didn't know if our first budget would be our last budget. I mean, we actually delivered the first budget in May with half the office staff than what you normally have because we were just going great guns on everything. We, did, we didn't have time to hire. We just had to keep moving on things. So what, what you saw with, uh, with Jim Flaherty in the office was a professional minister. Minister. Uh, and by that I mean somebody who took departmental advice, listened to it, uh, but also felt free to challenge it as minister. He recognized his role was to bring that political dimension there in a democratic system, seek advice, but engage with officials. He was very, uh, uh, he was very professional with them. He was very honest uh, with them, straightforward. He, he could be a very exacting, you know, taskmaster. I mean, he, you know, he didn't suffer fools gladly uh, because uh, he was no fool himself. He was a uh, strong intellect. Uh, questioned many things in, in a way to find things that could be better, brought a political dimension to, to stuff. So, you know, if you wanted to succeed in Jim Flaherty's office, you had to be on your toes. Uh, James, what was it? I mean, we all saw over the last year that he was clearly sick with this uh, skin disease, bloated and uh, uh, and uh, often at times emotional because of the drugs he was taking. Uh, did, did anybody ever, you and your friends say, Jim, you've done everything you possibly could. It's time to get get out of this game I, I did uh, personally and I know I know uh, you know the group that went with him to Ireland we said Jim you've given everything you can to public service to this country 
and we just hope you know as a colleague I said I wish you run forever because I'd like to keep serving with you as a colleague as my mentor but as a friend I just want you to have uh, a post-political life with Christine with your three sons doing the things that you love to do you know going on the golf trips and and being able to just experience the thing of life that he so richly deserved that's why it's so hard to to take this it's it just seems so unjust that at the end of all his public service was 20 years and of living that kind especially the suffering at the end which he he bore up so well like he he didn't want to talk about it he never complained about it if you asked him he just said thank you and he'd prefer to move on to another topic um, but it just you wish he'd had more time with uh, Christine the three boys his friends and family it's just it just seems all so unjust Miss Nash, it, it does seem like a tragedy. It does seem so unfair that he left uh, so soon after, uh, you know, spending 20-some years of his life in devotion and public service. Is there any personal moment that you'd like to share with Canadians in your dealings with him? Um, you know, I do remember one time uh, chatting with him about an upcoming budget. We'd always take the opportunity. I'd, I'd share with him what I thought the priorities should be, and obviously he would never tell uh, secrets about what was going to be in the budget. But it was always a very small meeting. There'd maybe be three or four people in the room. And um, uh, he, he just talked about how uh, how important it was that we have um, that we care about each other and that uh, we need to look out for people with disabilities and I knew uh, something about his personal situation that had been something he felt very strongly about um, and it was in that budget that he brought in the uh, tax measures for um, for people with disabilities and uh, I could just tell in that small meeting uh, that, you know, yes, he had a reputation for being uh, staunch conservative, you know, free market. You said it at the beginning of, of this segment, but um, Jim Flaherty, the person, my sense was that he had this huge heart, that he really was um, doing what he felt was best for the country in all its dimensions, and that there was uh, really a very, very decent human being uh, that, that underpinned Jim Flaherty, the finance minister. He was an extraordinary listener with colleagues or with sure. anyone. You'd bring him in with, to a meeting, he would be the one who would he'd make maybe a minute of you know, opening remarks and then he would turn it over to you. Often with colleagues, he would ask every colleague to speak before he spoke. It was, it was just an astounding listener and that's, he, he would take good ideas from anywhere. I think both Peggy and David have pointed to those, but I think what Sean threw... He both never of, took enough of my good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> he always had tremendous respect for you, Peggy, tremendous sure respect yes, and regard did. for you. He did, and he did have respect for colleagues across the floor, mm -hmm. but the humanity is what really is shown through in him, and I think you've talked about this in the last day, Bob, is, you know, and there's a story, if, if you wish me to tell it, I mean, one of our last trips to Ireland, we were there and, and there were some Canadians in a pub in Dublin, it was our last night there, and they recognized him and it was three generations and it was quite a sad story because they were all there, Their the father had uh, I think a terminal illness and so they were there to kind of touch base with their roots and what do you say to kids who are going to lose their father coming up, what do you say then to the grandmother who is going to lose her son and Jim Flaherty, I always remember this, he grabbed the grandma, he went out on the dance floor and he waltzed this beautiful Irish song and he just he didn't know what to say none of us knew what to say but he did exactly the right thing at the right time and we just said that's the perfect thing to do and th that's just the humanity and that's the person I'll always remember well thank you very much uh, he will be uh, greatly missed I appreciate you coming on for sure